Alrighty, folks, let's get this party started, shall we? Okay, so everyone's uh, busy making their birdhouses, and I wanted to kind of show you just for a brief second kind of my thought process, how I would approach making something like this, right? And hopefully that will start to give you maybe some clarity on potentially a workflow for you. Now, one of the first things that I start to do whenever I'm modeling anything, and you've heard me say this a number of times, is paint with a broad brushstroke. Just figure out the overall proportions of what this could potentially be before I start making some pretty destructive edits. We're going to model in passes, just like a traditional sculptor would, right? If you go over to one of our art labs and you just grab a big lump of clay, what's the first thing that you're going to do? If you're making a bust of someone, which is like, you know, from their kind of clavicle up, right? You're not going to start modeling the eye first, right? And getting all the details of, you know, the the eye ducts, the tear ducts, excuse me, the wrinkles. You're not going to do that first, right? You're going to flush out the planes and figure out the overall proportions first. And then when you're really happy with that, you'll jump in and start modeling all the details. We want to do the exact same thing as often as we can. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to figure out the overall proportions with the whole idea that eventually things are going to click together at some point and start to feel a little bit more representative to what the final model is going to be. Allow yourself to model and pass this. We're not trying to make a perfect model at the very beginning. Eventually, you'll get to a perfect model. But right now, we just want to start exploring things. So a couple important things that I did pretty early on. This is just a square. And I almost always give myself a center line. I just did that with a loop slice, just to give me a visual representation as to where the middle of the x-axis is. This is a symmetrical shape. So I want to be a smart modeler, not a hard-working uh, 3D modeler, and use our, use our mirroring tools and work in symmetry as much as I can to give us that final end result. Okay? Um, I'm blocking out what the roof line can look like, just with some very simple shapes here. And I just did this very quickly. As you can see from the shapes that I've created, they're just rectangles. There's nothing fancy about them. I moved and, and positioned my rectangles into shape, or into position, excuse me. And then this, of course, is going to be the little opening for the for my little bird. So I want to give him a nice little house, right? That'd be cool. Okay. So um, now that I'm pretty happy with the overall shape, I can actually start the modeling of it itself. I think it's important that we start to have a good general understanding of the volume that we're going to be working in before we actually start making some destructive edit and slicing. The more we can do this early on, the better and the faster our modeling operations are going to be. Okay. So uh, let's first things first. I want this to be to have both an interior and an exterior, okay? So we can actually see the inside of my little birdhouse. So here's what I'm gonna do. This is just a square. If I hide everything else, this is just a square that I've tapered by skilling those bottom polygons a little bit. However, I need to reconstitute and rebuild this part of my mesh pretty quickly so that I can get, um, oh, I don't know, let's see, maybe just an uh, inside wall, okay? That'd be pretty cool pretty easy. So how am I going to do that quickly? Well, there's a couple ways that we can go about doing this. I think for me, I'm going to just use the pen tool, kind of like what we did last week. Okay. And if I turn on good old, good old snapping, and of course if I enable my vertex snapping, how did I get to that option menu? Does anyone remember? Hold option. Yeah, hold the option key on your keyboard. You'll get all your snapping options, and I'm going to do some vertex snapping. Okay. If I go over into my basic tool tab and fire off the pen tool and enable wall mode way down here at the bottom. Sorry for the long scroll. And I don't know what the dimension is going to be yet, so I'll just put it at something pretty basic. The snap allows me to get what I'm after. Of course, I need to increase the thickness significantly and close it. This is a gigantic birdhouse, by the way. Oops, I put my offset to zero. Yeah. Okay, this happens from time to time, and you see how the walls are kind of going in a lot of different directions. The walls, how the, the poly strips are being laid out, is tied to the current orientation of the work plane. And since I was being a teacher and navigating around, I did a very bad job. So let's do this, and I'm also going to do outer. Let's try this again. This time I'm not going to orbit around. There we go. Now they're all orientated to the exact same the exact same plane. I'll drop the tool. I'm pretty happy with that. I've created the thickness of my walls and now I can start working working with them. I'm just going to extrude them up. And if I really wanted to be accurate, of course, enabling my snap 
will give me what I'm after. Okay, I'll scale these out until they match what I had prototyped earlier. And there they are. Those are really thick walls, but my, you know, I want this to be like gale force strength for my little birdie. I don't want my bird to get hurt during a storm, so I'm gonna make my walls real thick. Um, all right, that's looking pretty good. Oops, looks like I was off ever so slightly downstairs. Let me fix it real quick. Again, I'm just using the move tool. And that's pretty close for what we're trying to establish. Okay. Now that that's uh, completed, let's go back to my other mesh item, unhide the rest, and I can start cutting in all of this jazz. I don't need this piece anymore, so I'm going to delete it. And now what I'm left with on this mesh is, of course, <coughs> excuse me, uh, all the items that are going to be responsible for my booleans. So let's do this real fast. I know that I have some center line problems here. I, I intentionally made this top beam much larger so I could just simply slice it and move on. I don't really, don't really care too much about uh, its, its, uh, its height because, once again, our snapping tools will give us what we're after. Maybe this time I'll do a little grid snapping. I want to turn the visibility of our grid on just so you guys can see it. And I'm just going to run good old slice. There it is. All this stuff is garbage now. I don't really care so much about it. Actually, that may have been a little, a little premature. I'm going to go back and not do that. I'm going to pause just for a second uh, because I want my model. Yeah, there's actually two things that I want to do. I am going to slice that way, but I'm also going to slice horizontally this way. And I'm not going to use my grid snapping. I'm going to use my vertex snapping. That way I can slice that way. It's really what I'm after and what I need to delete is all of that. Okay. And I'm giving myself a center line here for the background mesh model itself. Okay. Because I want to slice this according to that. Making a peak, making a roof. Okay. Let's see how that works. It should be pretty entertaining. It should give me an okay result. I may be a little too accurate, but we'll see. We'll see how the Boolean operation uh, fixes things here in a second. All right. I want to bridge these real fast. That slice got rid of those top polygons. And now I'm ready to start slicing things in. Okay. Now, I don't want the hole for my little birdhouse to go all the way through the inside and the outside. So I'll just trim that back a little bit. And I can start pretty quickly doing the Boolean op for my little birdhouse. Let's do it real quick. Geometry, Boolean. We're going to use the solid drill tool. Okay. And the operation that I like the most is slice. Just gives us the most options. And it looks like it's done it in the background here. Let's inspect my mesh. Yep, that's good. That's good. Me likey. I did a good job. Okay. And now I'm in full-blown, excuse me, delete mode. Yeah, see, it didn't. And I was worried that it wouldn't slice across, but I can fix that real fast. Up here, it didn't do, go all the way through. That's an easy fix just with me. Well, he says with a certain degree of confidence. Of course, they're not going to be good friends. No, you're not going to do it at all for me. Thanks, Moto. Okay. Now, the other thing that I wanted to do, and again, my snapping tools are going to come in really, really well here, is, uh, let's see, I'm running slice. I'm just going to make a center line, and then I'm going to delete all of this stuff. That way, I can make one half of the model, focus my energy exclusively on getting this perfect and right and complete in every sense, then mirror it across the x-axis, all right? All right, so I know for my model, all of this jazz in here, and even these pieces, the edge of the roof. This is all garbage. I don't need this stuff anymore. Same with the inside bits. Don't forget the insides. There we go. Let's just delete it. See what we get. Don't need that piece over there. Yeah, it kind of looks like a Christmas tree. <laughs> a Christmas tree shape on the outside of my house, which is actually exactly what I want. That's what, what I'm uh, looking to, to achieve here. I want to use my, my great little bridge technique to make me a wall. 
to make me an opening, but you can see that it's produced that unwanted polygon, so I'll simply just delete it and uh, continue on. And that's it. Let's turn on my cutters, see what we're after. Does it work? Yeah, it works. It's looking really, really good. I'm pretty pleased with the result that I'm after. Uh, I have some modeling in here that I need to do and finish on the roof tiles themselves, but that's pretty easy, right? Now I have to make some decisions. Do I want my roof to go all the way up here, which could be pretty fun? Actually, I think I'm going to do that. Yeah, that will have a everything will come to a nice point, a perfect symmetrical ridge line. Let's mirror all of these pieces across the x-axis. Of course, we could use our snapping tools to do this, but I think for this time, since I've modeled around the origin of my scene, I'm going to change my action center to origin, so the mirror's tool handle will be, will be placed right smack dab in the middle of the x-axis. There we go. And now we have a symmetrical roof. Everything is, is pretty, pretty consistent, which is what I'm, what I'm after. Now this in here I didn't need, so I'll just delete that. And there's my little birdhouse. Okay. If you ever want to test to see how well you're doing, if things are connected or not connected or, or being created the way you want them to, hit the tab key, subdivide your mesh. It's amazing how much information the uh, subdivision surface modeling algorithm gives to us as to the quality of, of, uh, uh, of, our, of our geometry. Point being, we see a lot of bugs pretty quickly when we hit the tab key. All right. I do, however, have a couple issues. I don't need that anymore. There we go. I'm just going to inspect my mesh, make sure everything is still separate. Yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the result. But I have one gigantic issue left in here to manage, and that's the center circle. Okay, it's pretty angular. Okay, it's, it's actually more than pretty angular. It's very angular, right? And I want to go in and start slicing this up a little bit so that I can see, turn on the visibility of my verts, I apologize. Make them, whoops, make them real big so you all in the back can see, you know, a little too big. There we go. So we can see what's going on. Okay, I want to be able to use the power of our subdivision surface modeling engine to give me a perfect circle right there in the center, right? That'd be a really nice little benefit for us, okay? When we're working inside of 3D modeling, at the, very, at the very least, circles should always look like circles, not faceted, diamond, rocky things like that, right? Um, we can do better, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So let's do, let's do better. Now, on an odd shape like this, okay, with a circle, uh, we have some work in here that we need to accomplish. And before I go any further, I'm going to be a 3D modeler for a second. And uh, I'm going to make, I want to make a floor in here because I have to. There we go. Just fill that with a polygon. Same with the outside. And then I'm going to use my slice tools, my edge slice, both on the outside and the inside to connect all the verts and maintain all of my quad polygons. There we go. Aha. Wonderful. Okay, so now comes the really interesting job of, of slicing up this front face, this in here, okay, so that we can have the appropriate structure in the model so that when I hit the tab key, it maintains its shapes and creates a perfect circle for us. That's the goal in all of this, okay? Now, from our previous conversations about working uh, with sub-D modeling, what's the product of this? What should we be looking to infuse inside the mesh itself to give us the structure we need to maintain a perfect circle when we hit tab. Edges. We need to add some edges. Specifically, how many? And where? We have to establish the edges you got it. We've got to make that edge sandwich, right? So we, we look for the original. Yeah, absolutely. We look for the original. And then we have to add a new one above. So if here is, let me zoom around so you guys can see it. So if that is the original edge in here, I have to have one above it and below it, our edge sandwich. Okay. Now, how can we get this? Finish that thought, Hannah. The 
bevel tool is a good one to start. Loop slice is going to, in this particular instance, is not going to give us what we're after, right? Because the loop slice is going to look for a row of polygons and slice within that row. Like in the middle. Yeah. And this, we have a circle. And we don't want to slice around a loop. We want it to slice around the opening. So let's try the bevel tool. Okay, The edge bevel tool, especially when we change our edge shape from round to square, it's going to give us some really great results. Let's see what it does. Yeah, awesome. And it does a fantastic job. However, we now have some problems that are showing up. See how the mesh is kind of tearing apart up here? What we're doing is that we're doing an edge bevel on a gigantic n-gon. This thing is an n-gon, okay? It no likey that shape, okay? It doesn't understand how to insert new edges into a surface that is kind of, uh, from its definition, undefined, okay? A defined surface really has quad polygons. That's what our rendering engine in our entire production paradigm is centered around. So maybe before we start slicing things in and adding those new edge bevels, we create, we slice this into quad polygons. Get this into a compliant surface first, which will then help us get the appropriate structure for the circle second. Make sense? So it's kind of like, you know, sometimes you got to take a step backwards in order to take two steps forward, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead and start slicing. Uh, it's really easy to do this. I always look to see what's there first. Sometimes I get lucky. We don't necessarily need to add new verts, and we should try to be avoiding that process as much as we can. Here we go. I'm just going to use edge slice for all of this. Now up here, this, this vert is going there. Awesome. This vert is going all the way to the peak. Cool. Same with over there. So let's start by slicing from that one over to that side. And now I've created a polygon here, a quad polygon. One, two, three, four. Rock and roll. Now for that vert, I'm going to take it down to the corner, like that. The bottom feller already has one, and I'm just going to follow that pattern. So edge slice is shift C. You can also find the edge slice on your mesh edit collection of tools, and it's right there. Or not, shift C is slice, edge slice is, uh, is C, I apologize. All right, so that's looking pretty good. If we look at these polygons down here, these are all quads. But then we get up in here, and it, yeesh, not so hot. So maybe we continue slicing a little bit to get the result that we're after. I'm going to turn on multi-slice, slice all the way through. Now that's a quad polygon. That's a quad. These in here are not quads, so let's see what we can do. Yeah, I think I'm just going to go like this, cross that way, now that last one I didn't need to do because that's actually a quad polygon up here. If you look at it, one, one, two, three, four, and the same on the other side. All right, haha, -ha. excellent, pretty happy with that, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, I'm going to need to do the exact same thing on the inside to ensure that any future, uh, any future modeling operations happen the way I would like them to. That's interesting. Now, is that a bug? Ah, there's some stuff that's not joined. I was like, why is that not doing what I wanted to not do? I'm thinking maybe some of these verts in here. Yeah, I got six verts, so one of these isn't joined. Yeah, these guys in here aren't joined. So if I cruise over to my vertex collection of tools, I'm just going to use the join command, which is going to weld them together. We get this little popover uh, with some, some options in here. I, just, you know, I don't want to average their position. I don't want to keep the one vert polygons. Uh, you can you know, join discontiguous UVs. You can leave that on or off. In this particular moment, it doesn't really matter. Okay, two verts joined. I like that. Now, oops, hit the wrong button. What's going on in there? That's good. These need to be joined as well. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Okay, now I can start slicing this up 
I'm getting what I'm wanting. The moment you, you encounter something that's odd, like I just did, stop, pause, and investigate, okay? Admittedly, a lot of 3D modeling is just trying to figure out problems. We create them, and then we have to solve them. So if the computer is doing something that you just don't understand, stop and look very carefully, like, like I just did. Investigate how many verts are in the mesh. Visually, it may be one, but there could be two that are right on top of each other, right? Okay, with that in mind, let's see if my, uh, my bevel op on the front, I'm going to see if I can do the back at the exact same time. Oops, I forgot, I didn't do all of this stuff in here. I'm sorry. This is all edge slice, you got it. There we go. And now, I want to see if I can do the front and the backs at the exact same time. This is going back to that beveling operation once again that I was do doing earlier. This time, or once again, my edge shape is set to square, and this time I'm hoping to get, yeah, I'm not getting any of that visual tearing. And the new edges that I'm creating around my mesh are working exactly like I'm wanting. Now these down here, let's investigate. Yep, these aren't joined, so let me join them. Same with that one, I bet you. Yep. That was a product of when I mirrored one half across the x-axis. It didn't mirror all the joints together. That's looking good. Okay. Let's try beveling it again. Yeah. Now that's kind of an odd shape there, but I can fix it. Yeah, that's kind of strange, but I can fix it. There we go. Since it's on a flat surface, I don't have to worry too much about uh, maintaining its planar shape. Same with this guy. I'm just going to move it along the X and the Y. Yeah, let's hit the tab key. Ha ha! There it is. Wonderful. I'm starting to see exactly what I want to see here. Now I have the perfect circle, but you fix one thing and you break another, right? <laughs> now I got to go in and, and uh, continue slicing up the rest of my mesh to, to lock in all those corners and get the result that I'm after. Okay. Now I'm not going to do that because I want to move on. I, this, I know, admittedly, this is kind of like watching paint dry. <laughs> uh, but I think it's uh, important ideas going forward. All right. One other thing that we should look to do sculpturally inside of our mesh are those roofing tiles a little bit. Now, our roof is pretty planar. It's very planar, actually. And it looks a little two-dimensional, in my opinion. It doesn't look like something that has volume and weight and substance. The proof is always in the pudding. Let's go over and look at the render. So this is what the rendering engine is physically seen. And it just looks, for a lack of a better term, meh. Right? It just looks meh, especially the roof. Right? It doesn't have, it doesn't have the, the required information, in my opinion, that captivates my attention. And it makes me understand that this is a living, breathing piece, you know, maybe a piece of wood, okay, that's been hammered together with small nails to create this lovely five-star estate for my little birdie, okay? Specifically, if you look at the front leading edges of my birdhouse, there are some issues in here that I really would like to resolve. Check out all this. Look at that. That's, I don't like that. It's pretty ugly, actually, right? There's no separation between the different polygons in there, right? It doesn't look like three individual kind of hunks of wood stacked on top of each other to make a roof, right? It looks like, in, you know, in my opinion, just like one computer-generated blob of polygonal you know, shapes, right? I want to start visually separating these things out. A really great easy trick for us to start separating these planes out and to achieve a more photorealistic results is to add tiny little edge bevels and radiuses to every single planar shape out there. It's, it's impossible, impossible for us to create a perfectly 90 degree edge in, in our world, right? We can get close, we can get darn close, right? 
Uh, we can get to like you know 89.9, right? But it's never completely 100% perpendicular. The faces, that is. Okay. Only a computer can make a surface like this. This doesn't speak to what reality creates and what we see in reality all the time. So let's check it out. A small little addition here. All right. I'm just going to select all of my roofing tiles. And this is a cool power user trick. This is Pat's power user trick of the day. Okay. I want to, it was really, really, really easy for me to select a whole series of polygons, contiguous polygonal shapes, right? I want to convert that polygonal selection over into an edge selection, right? And here's how you do it. It's really easy. It begins with the option key. See how all of our selection states now say convert? Now, we're currently in polygons, so we're going to convert to edges. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the product of this. Bloop. And now we've transformed our polygonal selection into an edge selection. With my edge selections in tow, I can fire off uh, a bevel. I'm going to go return my edge shape back to round, leave its round level at zero, and pull down on the little blue hand. I start giving it just a little bit of a chamfer. A little bit goes a long way. If we return to our render, yeah, that one small little thing, that small little radius that was added to the edges of our polygonal shapes is starting to visually separate these parts and pieces away from each other, right? Now they feel like three roofing tiles stacked on top of each other. Just a bevel. I did the blue, but I changed my, uh, my shape from square back to round. Yep. And this is starting to look pretty good. In addition to, to visually separating out the mesh, this also creates a wonderful specular highlight on the, on the geometry itself. If you look very carefully, what we've gained visually from an artistic perspective here is this specular highlight. See how we're catching the light in our scene here? Our human subconscious is looking for this specular highlight. It's something that we're trained to see almost instinctually from day one. So we want to make sure that it's there. It's impossible for us to create perfect, perfect 90 degree corners in reality. Everything is going to have a little radius, so everything is going to catch the light around the corner. We want to do that for our models as well. It just makes it feel more photographic. Okay. Cool, huh? I think it's pretty neat. All right. Okay. Now that we have the basic structure for our house created, let's start talking about how we can make it come to life. Because it's pretty boring, right? The rest of our, our day today is going to be spent kind of looking at the artistic perspective of creating a good image. If you go back to the first day of class, I mentioned many, many times that we wear a lot of hats in the 3D modeling world. Some days we put a little construction worker hat on and we're building sculptures and we're creating birdhouses like we are today. Other days we kind of put our it's in my imagination, it's a little French beret, and we paint things, right? That's just the image that comes to my mind. And then other days, we grab our, our camera, and we're photograph or photographers, okay? Today, we're going to be photographers, and we're going to consider how we can take, or how we can create a really pretty picture that captivates our audience and really starts to help them understand what it is that they're going to be looking at, okay? All of these ideas are going to be applied to the second part of the building that you hopefully just finished creating. Uh, you know, it, we're going to go through the exact same process pretty early on. Now for me, one of the things that I try to nail down pretty quickly uh, early on is the composition, the framing of our camera, right? What is the camera physically seeing? And then I'm going to craft everything around that perspective. Remember, this is all an illusion. Right? This is a trick, okay? This is a camera trick, right? This is fake. This is not real one bit. We are the tricksters here. I'm not going to model and create something that the camera is fundamentally not going to see. We are not trying to recreate reality, right? Because if you were trying to recreate reality, just go outside, okay? There is reality. Grab a camera, go take a picture of it. We're trying to create an artistic perspective of reality, okay? We're trying to showcase, uh, maybe to our audience, something that they've never seen before using 3D modeling and animation. Okay? 
So let's start thinking about the illusion and start crafting uh, what that perspective is going to be. Now I always like, as I mentioned, to figure out what the camera sees and then maybe perhaps build a little scene to supplement and to support that perspective. Um, so let's do this, and this might be kind of fun. First things first, let's, uh, where would we naturally find a, a birdhouse? In a tree. I like that. So maybe we put this in a tree, in a natural place, uh, or a place that we'd naturally expect to find it. Now, I'm a big believer that if there's one thing you should not spend time modeling, it's rocks and trees, okay? I've modeled rocks and trees, and maybe it's just me, but I hate modeling trees. It's just, it's the most mind-numbing thing on the face of the planet. I've been downloading a bunch of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Let someone else model a tree, right? It's like, you can go online. There are a lot of really great online stores where for like $5, you can buy like a pack of 10 trees, right? I cannot make a tree in $5 worth of my time. Right? I can't do that. No one, no one can do that. Right? It is impossible for you to make a, a, you know, a model and textured tree in five dollars worth of your time. You can't do that. Right? Let someone else do that. It's mind-numbingly dumb. I hate making trees. Like rocks too. I'm not gonna make a rock. Are you kidding me? A rock? No. I'm not going. I'm not doing that. Right? I'm gonna let someone else do it for me. Right? Those are the two things in my world that I just refuse to do: trees and rocks. Luckily. The developers down at the foundry have given us some really great starting points. They've, they've provided a couple of simple trees that we can use um, to start helping us craft uh, some really compelling images and to fill in the blanks. So I've, I've transitioned over into the Layout tab. And then downstairs in our preset library, I'm in the Meshes section. And I believe it's under the Organic yep. folder. Let's do it. Here we go, Trees. Yeah, and look, look at all these lovely trees that, that the foundry has provided, provided to us. And I'm going to pick the one with the leaves on it and simply just double clicking on it. It's going to load it into the scene. There is a tree. Look at your item. Look at your, oh, wait, are you in your, are you in your, the preset library? Give it some time. The preset library takes a long time on these machines to load in, so that's not uncommon. Uh, just give it a couple seconds, right? It's on the layout, layout tab, and they should all be in there. If they're not, don't fret, don't worry about it. Uh, no, I'm in the layout tab. Yeah. Yeah, it's up there. It should be up there. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Tyler's just loaded, all of his loaded in, so it is working. It's just taking some time. We're all pinging the exact same folder on our server right now, so it's probably, yep, you have Hanya's, yours just loaded into. It's just taking a while for us to migrate all that data over to your desktop, so just give it some time, okay? Um, you won't have this experience at home. Uh, if you download and install all the content, it'll just pop right in because it's not having to go to the library. And then back again. There's, I have different trees at my house on Lodo at my house. I have different trees at my house on my desktop at home than here, actually. Than great. Here. Great. Just saying that because it's, it's weird. They're different. Why are they different? You know, they're different versions of the content. Oh, okay. Yep. Point being, I'm just going to simply double click on my preset and load it in. Okay. Whoa. That was uh, not what I was looking for. Okay. So where are every one of these presets going to be loaded into? The origin, and right now you can see that uh, I have a gigantic house. Okay, now before you start making your tree bigger, let's investigate this a little bit. Okay, the Moto rendering engine is physically based; it wants to work with real-world units, and it wants to understand as closely as it can scale. Okay, all of the Moto presets have been scaled. Okay, so instead of making my tree bigger. What should I really look to do? Make the house smaller to match the size of the tree itself. Now, one of the problems that we have when working in scales is understanding how big and how small things are, right? The grid actually helps us out. If you look carefully here, you can see a whole bunch of grid squares, okay? That number right there represents the size of each grid square, okay? So each one of these squares 
is 500 millimeters, you know, it's 500 millimeters square. Um, so that will help you kind of get in a big, you know, crazy understanding of all of this. Last week we talked about how we can transition uh, our moto preferences to, uh, you know, feet and inches. If that's uh, the world that you live in, I say do it. I'm going to leave mine at millimeters, okay? And uh, let's just grab my mesh. I should combine all this stuff into one. Cut, paste, there we go. And let's start scaling my little birdhouse so that it works. Now, I don't know where this is going to live. So let's have fun with it. Maybe it makes sense that it's attached to like, I don't know, a tree branch or something. There we go. Sorry. Oops. Let's see what that looks like in render. Now the placement of this inside of our render, oops. There we go. Now that doesn't look real. No likey that. But this is why they give us a split view here in the render environment, right? So that we can very quickly make changes, be inspired by something else. You know, it doesn't, again, this is just a trick. It doesn't have to look like it's precisely, you know, attached to the tree. Or maybe we walk away from this idea that it's nailed to the tree. Maybe it's hanging off of a tree branch. What I'm trying to do here is just craft a pretty picture. Now, I like having this tree branch in here. This is kind of neat because it's reminding me that I'm in a tree. So instead of moving the camera around at this moment, I want to move my mesh around to get what I'm after. Of course, being mindful. Of the relationship of the, of the tree to the birdhouse, to the camera. And something like that's going to do me. I'm pretty happy. That's a good start at the very least. Okay, That's a, that's a good start. Now, I try to establish this pretty early on because the rest of the things that we're going to be establishing are going to be linked to our perspective of, of our scene itself. Okay, um, This is a, is a good start, but it's definitely not the finish. Okay. Now that I've established what the viewfinder of my digital camera is going to capture, let's start filling in the blanks. And I, like Bob Ross, you guys know Bob Ross? Happy tree guy? Love me some Bob Ross, right? If you ever watch Bob Ross, he does, you know, I, I am of the Bob, Bob Ross generation. You know, I watched Bob Ross on PBS as it aired live, right? Um, I used to watch that show all the time. The joy of painting was absolutely, in my mind, kind of my first introduction to layers, right? Because if, if you ever watch Bob Ross, where does he start every single painting that he does? In the background. He starts in the background, and then he works to the foreground. Okay? Now, I think that's a really great kind of way for us to begin, right? Start in the background and start layering information uh, to the foreground. So for us, what drives the background of our scene? The environment, right? That gray gradient in the background of our scene is driven exclusively by the environment item inside of our shader tree. Specifically, let's check it out. Here's our environment section. Bum, 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 bum. There it is. Here's the actual environment. This is just a category. This is the actual environment that's responsible for creating the gray gradient. Of course, naturally, it has its own material. Now, I'm more than encouraged to go in and start tweaking all these these uh, color values over here. This is cool. I could spend all day doing this, right? Um, but there's a different way that we can go about doing this, right? Because if you think about it, the current illumination of our environment is really driven by two different things. That gray gradient in the background, but also the directional light inside of our scene itself. Okay? This fellow right here. We work in an additive environment, okay, in 3D. It's just like painting. The more paint that you put down on top of your scene, the more paint that you put down on your canvas, the colors and the hues of what's there are going to shift as the paint starts to mix together a little bit, okay? 
we're doing the exact same thing. We add lights, we add environments, we add things in, and our color, our color hues on the image starts to shift and change a little bit. So our directional light is having a big, big impact on the quality of our scene itself. Okay. So let's look at the directional light. The directional light, if I was to, I'm going to hit undo to get back to that gray gradient because I just can't stand this pink. There we go. Um, if you look at our directional light, in every sense, it's simulating what type of light source? Does anyone want to take a guess? Sun. The sun. It really is. The directional light is an exterior light source. It's really kind of a, an infinite wall of light, like our sun, that's coming from a very specific orientation inside of our three-dimensional scene, like our sun, right? You can never escape the rays of the directional light. They're always in the scene, right? Never change. It's like the sun. You can never be out of the sun unless you're like, you know, in a building or something, right? So our directional light is going to have, uh, you know, this infinite wall of light, okay, coming from a very specific orientation inside of the scene. Now, I'm pretty happy with the illusion that I've got. I like this little shadow here. That's pretty neat, okay? I'm digging it. But the color itself is not at all what I want it to be, right? The default color for every single light in Moto is white. Now, if you've taken a science class, pop quiz, okay, hopefully you've taken a science class, um, is it possible to create a white light source in our universe? No. no. It's impossible, right? Physics does not allow it, right? What color are our natural lights? Color is our sun. Yellow. yellow, right? Yeah, yellow, orange, and it's going to change its color temperature based off of its per position uh, in the horizon, right? As the sun starts to set, its color change and its color hue is going to change. Okay, uh, its color temperature, excuse me, is going to change. The color temperature of the of the sun in the middle of the day is different than what it is at the end of the day or in the morning, right? Big point. It's never white. Never ever white. Okay. So this is the first thing that we want to change to start achieving that kind of photographic look. Get away from white. Well, the next question that pops into mind is, well, what color should it be, right? Right? If it's not supposed to be white, and you just said it's supposed to be kind of many shades of yellow, what color should it be? Is it like that? Is that that's kind of yellow, right? That doesn't exactly look like the sun at the moment, OK? Is it more kind of orangey? Maybe at sunset, it's kind of orangey, right? So we're in the ballpark. Is it red? It's really never red, OK? Luckily for us, the color temperature of all lights can be measured. Our scientific community quite quickly uh, can create this Kelvin co color temperature. If you go into any traditional photography studio around the world, photographers, they measure the quality and the temperature, the, the color of their lights and Kelvin, okay, that's what this number is here. And the developers have given us a really great series of presets that will get us started, okay. Let's just pull down, check it out. So here's all the color temperatures for a number of different things, right? And I really think the descriptions of all these color temperatures will help us kind of figure out how we want to use or which one of these presets we want to use, right? Generally speaking, you know, oops, excuse me. You know, 6,000-ish, okay, is a good place for sunlight, okay? Here's sun at noon, right? Let's just do daylit sky at 6,000 degrees. Yeah, and now it looks a little like it's outside. But we're getting a false read. If you look at the illumination that's happening on my, on my lighthouse and on the tree, it's slightly yellow, which is what I'm after. But what's completely breaking that illusion? The background, right? That ugly gray gradient, okay? That gray gradient is both awesome, but it's the biggest challenge that we have to overcome on the rendering side, okay? It would be neat, you know, to be able to go in and change my environment, my environment material, to something that kind of works with the color temperature of, uh, of, my, little, of my little house, right? And this is kind of the big challenge that I have. It's like, well, what, is that, what does that color temperature look like, right? I know the sky is generally blue. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, the zenith color is the, so in, in, a, in a sphere, 
Okay? Imagine our world, we live in a sphere, right? The universe is a sphere. Okay? It's a gigantic sphere that's expanding every moment of every day, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it is in fact a sphere, right? Well, if you were standing in the middle of that sphere, the zenith is the point that's immediately above your head, okay? That's the zenith. And then the nadir is the opposite of that, the point that's directly below your feet, okay? And then the sky color and the ground color, that's kind of, you know, right around the horizon line. That's the zones in between the zenith and the nadir. So you could definitely go in and start tweaking this a little bit. Maybe I make this All right in there. I could even go around and make my ground color like super green, like a dark, dark green. And that's what we get, which is pretty neat. That's a step in the right direction. It's starting to feel better, but it's still not that hot, right? Not that hot at all. We can do better than this, okay? Because now we're picking and choosing, and oftentimes we don't pick and choose the right thing, right? And I want to be a little bit more accurate. I want to try as best I can to start making a nice visual connection between the quality, the light quality of my directional light and that background. What this is, it all kind of gets distilled into something called a physical sun, okay, and a physical sky. This physical sun and sky makes a direct connection between the light and the environment. Because I want both of them working together, okay? The color of my directional light should be influenced by the color of our environment. Let me show you how it works. It's pretty neat. It's very easy to set up. However, we're going to start with my directional light, okay? With my directional light enabled, or excuse me, with my directional light selected, I'm going to go down over here into its properties, okay? And way down here at the bottom, of its properties panel, we have a section called Physical Sun. And I'm just going to turn it on. Enable the Physical Sun for this specific directional light. Okay? Now, what's cool about this is that we now have a time of day. We have a date. Okay? Let's do our date. So what is today's date? Today is uh, the 22nd. So let's do 3-22-18. And it is, oh, not, maybe I should do 2018. There we go. Uh, and it is currently 10.52. There we go. And I guess we, I never can remember, are we in daylight savings time or did it just end? I can never remember. I always get backwards. It ended, so I won't, we're not going to be in daylight savings time. Okay. Now, of course, it's a rainy day right now, so we're not getting a real great representation of what this looks like. But now we're beginning to simulate what the sun or the, the sun's current elevation inside the sky is, right? And the directional light is changing its hue based on that on that time of day. Let me prove this to you very directly. Okay. Watch what happens when I start increasing the time value. So I'm just gonna put my cursor on these double arrows and slide, left click and slide to the right, which is gonna interactively change that value. Now it wigged out because I'm all zoomed in. But watch what happens to my birdhouse. The directional light is physically rotating. We can see the leaves changing their color, or excuse me, the, the shadows changing their location. The color temperature of my light is changing. Here I am at 5 o'clock. Here's 6 o'clock. The sun's going down behind the horizon line. That's pretty cool. So we're physically changing its placement in the sky itself. Okay. If I look at my 3D view, Here's the icon that represents our physical sun and sky. And check it out. You can actually see that that angle is changing. It's rotating around, rotating around its uh, cor correct trajectory to simulate the sun rising and falling in the sky itself, which is pretty neat, actually. Let's go back in. Ooh. Yeah, there we go. I just changed my clamp intensity to replace, which gives us a little bit more of a punch of the colors. Yeah, a little bit brighter. That's pretty cool. It's actually changing its light temperature. Here in March, you know, the sun is always pretty low to the horizon line, okay? Um, so we're not getting a, a significant dramatic shift. Here, let's put our, our date to, like, June. 
see what see what that does. Yeah, because the canopy of the trees are getting a lot of shadows in there. But it's pretty neat. All right. Okay. So that's neat, that's cool, but let's make it better. I mentioned earlier that we need to make a connection between our physical sun, our now directional light, okay, and the environment. Now, I'm going to go back down into my environment material. Click on it. Check it out. Of course, naturally, we've been working with this, the four color gradient. If you go into this pull down menu, ooh, physically based daylight, okay. Now, the colors in the back, okay, all of these have been turned off, and this part is now active and alive, okay? And look what's happening over here in my render, okay? I am no longer in control of that background gradient, okay? If I was to go back to my directional light and change its relative time in the day, watch what happens to that background gradient. It changes its color. There it is in the afternoon. Here is 2 o'clock. It's getting bluer as the sun is beginning to uh, set. Here it is at uh, 4 o'clock, getting hazy. 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. See how it's getting more orangey now as the sun is going into the horizon line. Here it is at 6.22. This is probably a magic hour where the sun is... The sun is under the horizon line, but it's still kind of light outside. Sun is set, and now we're at nighttime. Cool, huh? With both of these properties enabled, we can start making a more meaningful connection between our directional light and the background itself. There's one more option in here that we get to play around with, because if you look at the way the shadows Maybe I like this gradient in the background. This is cool for me. I'm digging it. Okay, uh, but I really don't like the shadows and how the shadows are falling on the birdhouse itself. That's no bueno for me. I want to fix that. Check it out. I'm gonna go back over here to my physical sun properties on my directional light. They're being cut off at the moment because of the size of my interface. There's a north offset. This thing. Watch what happens when I rotate or when I drag this value. Yeah, now it's rotating the entire disk, the solar disk, around. Yeah, there we go. And now I'm getting something that's a little bit more what I had before, or what I, you know, what I want. I liked having that shadow in there, and it's starting to look pretty good. Pretty neat, huh? I love just being able to go through like a day cycle. Like here's the sun early, early in the morning. And the sun rises and you see the shadows rotating and moving like they should. As the sun goes through its, its, nat its natural flight path. That's pretty cool. All right, I think I'll leave it there at 15.34. So use this. This is a great way to enter into the world of photorealism for our models. And we want to do this pretty early on. The lighting of our sets and scenes should be one of the first things that we do, not the lasts, right? Because remember, we're working in an additive, additive environment. The moment we change or add a light, okay, our textures are going to change their values and, their, and our understanding of their colors, right? Uh, the separation between the foreground and the background is going to change. So it's a good practice to start establishing our lighting setup very, very early on so that when we're adding textures and additional lights, we can understand the impact of those new items inside of the render itself. Cool, huh? All right. I'm going to add one more light in here because I, I want to look at what we can do uh, to create some some better, some better lighting. Now, this is my little birdhouse. I want to make it, you know, kind of inviting for my little guy to come in and hang out, right? It's not too inviting at the moment. It's kind of a dark hole. I want to make it all nice and warm and fuzzy, okay? So my little bird knows he's, uh, he's welcome. Um, 
when it comes to making pretty pictures, we want to be able to control the shadows as much as we can. And that deep, dark black hole in the center of my birdhouse is really, really suspect to me. Whenever something gets rendered as black, it's no going back, right? We can't really shift those values to you know, make it lighter on the inside, right? It's called clipping. Once we render a black pixel, it's always, always, always going to be a permanent. There's no detail in that area anymore, right? I can only make a black pixel gray and then white, but I can never add additional pixels in there that will give us more detail, right? So we want to try to stay away from pure black pixels as much as we can. And the inverse of that is also true. Pure white pixels will also be clipped, okay? We're going to lose detail on that area uh, almost instantly, okay? So what I'm going to do to solve this problem is put, another, is put another light in there, right? And I think for me, let's see, I'm going to go in and add a point light. I'm a big fan of point lights. Point lights are, are pretty great. Let's go ahead and add one into my scene. All lights are created at the origin of our three-dimensional universe. There it is. That's what a point light looks like inside of our three-dimensional viewport. Now, just based on its icon, what type of illumination properties do you think a point light's going to create for us? It's going to go outward from the center. Point. You got it. You got it. So, kind of like a light bulb, right? Point lights are very, very similar to a light bulb. It's a single spot in space, and light rays are being emitted in every direction from that point, point light, okay? Point lights are fast, and they're cheap to render, right? They're kind of like the, like the most simple light form inside of our three-dimensional scene. They're, they go back a long, long time. They're one of the first lights that we've had. And I'm going to put my point light on the inside of my house. And maybe I put it back a little bit. There we go. Let's fire off the render and see what we get. Whoa! A little too bright. Okay. Let's reduce its radiant intensity significantly. Still way too bright. Still way too bright. Here, let's do this. Yeah, no, it's on. There we go. Let's do point oh one. There we go. Yep. Me like you that. That's looking pretty good. Now I'm controlling the illumination from the inside. Let's give it a good color. It's never white. Don't want to use white lights. Maybe put like a, a really nice comforting color on the inside of our house. Maybe like a nice dark yellow. What would a blue look like? Looks like the TV's on in there. So let's go back to a, a yellow. I like to experiment with color. Sometimes we can make some fun stuff in here. Purple's kind of fun. Go back to a, a, nice, a nice deep dark yellow. And now I'm going to start playing around. I don't like that there's still a pretty significant shadow in there. Oops. Clicked off my light. Okay, now I can really understand what it's doing. Yeah, there we go. I know it's hard to see in the projector. It's definitely much, much, much better on uh, on my computer screen. I'm pretty happy with the results that I've that I've generated here. Uh, let's just brighten it. Oops. Ever yeah, so slightly. Yeah, I'm cool with that. That's looking pretty great. I'm pretty pleased with the result. Now we're adding some illumination on the inside of our house, uh, just to give it a little bit more a little bit more interest. Okay. You'll have to continue to play around if you're doing this with me on the radiant intensity. The radiant intensity determines the brightness of the light itself. Okay, And I've had to go to a very, very, very low value to make it work inside the context of my three-dimensional scene. All right. That's pretty neat. I'm liking that. This is a, this is a, a, step, a step in the direction that I'm uh, hoping to go in. Um, if we were to render this out, it's still going to just take a couple seconds to render. But at the very least, we've started to add the framework for our model in here that's going to allow us to texture this a little bit more directly and with a, with a high degree of certainty as to what the final effect is going to look like. At this point, inside of my production process, this is locked down. I'm not going to change this anymore. Okay, This is it. Okay, 
Um, I'm not going to make any changes to my camera composition or my lighting. And all the textures are going to be applied to this. So break the habit of moving your camera around inside of the preview window. There has to come a point when you need to stop. You need to lock it down and physically say, this is the picture that I'm going to make and then craft everything around that illusion. Okay. This is the picture that I'm going to make. So I'm just going to stop fiddling with the, the placement of the camera and the lights going forward. All right, I'll tell you what, now is a really, really good time for a break. Uh, let's come back at 11.15, uh, please.
OK, so now that we have uh, the basic framework for our render kind of established, we need to start filling in the rest of the blanks. And specifically, we need to look very directly at the textures on our objects themselves. Okay? Now, we spent some, some time talking about materials and textures, but I want to talk about the, uh, the role of textures in the context of a house. Okay? Because really, we have some big challenges in here that we need to overcome. Specifically, how do we take an image and place it around our, uh, our really crazy geometry, like a roof or a wall, uh, in a way that creates the compelling illusion that we're after, but hides a lot of the mechanical sides of a texture itself? Well, let me introduce you to the idea of tiling textures. Tiling textures flood an entire region with, you know, with texture information. Hopefully, if we can find a good seamless texture, a texture that doesn't have a noticeable repeating pattern in it or any noticeable repeating seam, excuse me, we'll be able to craft a little bit more of a direct, uh, uh, a direct illusion here inside the computer itself. So let me show you a great resource for us to go and find tiling textures. Now, these guys don't give me any money. I've been going to their website for many, many, many years. I'm a big believer that they are, in every sense, kind of our first stop when it comes to the, cur uh, comes to the, the curation of textures. It's just simply textures.com. This is a website that's been around for many, 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 many years. There's the URL, textures.com. They're a great resource. Pretty much everyone in our industry cruises through this site at one point or another. And uh, they're a really fantastic, fantastic organization. Now, to download textures, and they're even doing some cool things like 3D scanned objects from their site, you need to be able to, or you need to sign up for their site. It's free. There's also a paid membership. A lot of the high end stuff, like the 3D scanned surfaces and the models that they provide, require a premium membership. But for, the, but for us, for what we're doing, uh, the free membership is just fine. I Honestly, I've been going to textures.com for probably 15 years. I've never once paid for it. Yeesh. I probably should pay for it you know, now. <laughs> I've used so much of their stuff uh, in, my, in my work that I, maybe I should throw them some cash every once in a while. Uh, but there's some really good stuff in here. So um, let me log in real fast. And yes, I'm going to choose not to share my login information with you guys. There we go. All right. So when you sign up for the free account, you get 15 credits a day, a day for downloads, right? And if you're really strategic in what you download, you'll never really bump into that limit, right? Just don't download everything you click on, and you'll be fine, right? So I'm coming to this site to find some good tiling textures, some high quality images that I can use to wrap around my model. Now, this is far, far superior to what you're going to find on Google because these images are purpose built for our workflow. Okay? It used to be, in all honesty, this website used to be called cgtextures.com because it was laser focused for 3D artists. Let me show you specifically what I'm talking about. Now, I want to have, uh, let's see, for my little birdhouse, whoops, I want to have maybe some roofing tiles. And let's do, let's do something fun like one of these slate roofing tiles. Yeah, OK. So this is pretty cool. And this is why we choose to come to textures.com, because most all of these um, are seamless. Let me explore. Let me help you understand what a seamless texture is all about. So here's the original image that this seamless texture was created from. It's just a photograph, like any other photograph. This person just went out, took a picture of the roof, ran, ran it through some software to give us the result that we're after. Now, if we were to put this image okay, over on our model inside of our you know, birdhouse model, we'd see a seam because it's going to stamp. It's going to repeat this image. Let me show you. Let me just download it real fast. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to put all the polygons for my roof into their own material group so I can control and then edit them individually. In addition, let's import in, oh, actually, hold on a sec. I apologize. I recognize or I remembered that. There we go. I saved it to an odd folder. Let's do it again. I'm sorry. Image map, load image. Let's navigate to where that, that image has been saved. For me, I, I placed it on my desktop. There it is. 
All right. Now, if you look very, very carefully in here, yeah, right now, it's using the UV map projection type, which is not what I want. Let's go ahead and do cubic. Yeah, and as this begins to update, I'm going to make the size of this, of this texture much, much smaller, just so we can maybe perhaps see where it repeats. Getting kind of blurry, too. This may have been not the best one. Let's see if I can force it. Let's look at it from the side. I'm going to ruin my composition. And I know I just said, don't change your camera. <laughs> Almost there. Let's see if we can seam it. See the seam. This one is so good. Ah, here's the seam right here. Here's the vertical seam. You can see how the tiles don't match up. Because it's taking this one image and it's stamping it both horizontally and vertically inside of our three-dimensional space. On a standard photograph, uh, you're going to see that, that boundary where the stamp you know, gets done again over and over and over and over again. Right? We want to have a seamless texture that doesn't have that boundary in it or as, as much as it can, it's reduced. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo. All right, let's try this again. I apologize for the live streamers that just had to listen to me sneeze. OK, so this is looking OK. I want to see if I can resolve that seam in there, which is why these seamless textures on textures.com are really kind of cool. And this is the benefit. Check it out. They even give a little preview. Yeah. Now, in this preview, do you see any sort of natural seam? like a hard line, both horizontally and vertically. No. You see the pattern every once in a while repeating? Remember, this is a very small tile, a very small image being repeated, boof, 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 this way, both horizontally and vertically inside the seam itself. This is actually a pretty legit image. I like this one a lot. This one's pretty cool. They even give you some options, or they did at least. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And zoom in, see what it looks like. Pretty cool. I like that one. Let's go and see if we can find another one. Something that's maybe perhaps a little bit more appropriate for our birdhouse. I could do this all day, by the way. Until you run out of credit? Huh? Until you run out of credit? No, I download very little. It's like we're going shopping for textures. I love it. Now, not all of them are seamless, so we have to be careful with what we download. There is an option that allows you to sort by seamless up here. All right, see what we get. Um, I'm just going to pick one. See these little scallops? These are kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's come back to that here in a second, OK? All right, let's jump back over to Modo. And I'm going to delete the image that's in there. And I want to put in a new image map for my roof. There we go. That's the one. OK, so things are starting to look pretty cool here. OK, we're starting to put these textures in. And I'm liking the style that I, I'm achieving. However, I have some work in here that I need to do. And if we go back in time a little bit and start thinking and talking about uh, the different parameters of how our shader tree operates, what's the one element, the one item in our 3D scene that's physically responsible for the placement of our texture on the model? Does anyone remember what it's called? Oh, texture the texture locator. The texture locator is entirely responsible for placing the image on the mesh itself. OK. So I got my image selected down here in my shader tree. And in the Properties panel, 
the projection type is what I need to manage. Now we don't have a UV map and when you go to GCOM 424 next semester we'll talk a lot about UV maps. Okay? UV maps are a critical, a critical component to the texturing pipeline um, and I, I'm, I'm going to save that conversation for the next class. Uh, but for today what we're going to do is change it from UV map to one of the other projection types. Now we have to do some analysis here. What basic surface type is my little roof? What's its shape? It's flat. it's flat. It's very flat. So I know that maybe I should experiment with planar or perhaps cubic. Those are good natural projection types. I'm not going to choose cylindrical or spherical because that's not the shape of uh, the polygons that this image is going to get mapped to. I'm going to try cubic and see what that gives me. Yeah, now things are starting to work a little bit more directly. However, if we look at the, the result, man, they're gigantic. I need to make these roofing tiles much, much smaller. Okay? Now, there's a couple ways that we can do this. There's a channel box way over in our properties tab. But we could, if we wanted to, begin to go in and maybe influence the actual texture locator itself. Now, check it out. Down here in our properties, or excuse me, in our OpenGL viewport, of course, naturally, we have the camera. Here's the light itself. But if you ever wondered what these big cubes are down at the bottom, or sometimes they're a cylinder or a flat plane, that's the texture locator. This is the, visual, the visualization of the actual texture locator itself. Now, if you don't see these, make sure in this viewport, hit the O key, and under the visibility section, turn on show texture locators, or just be aware that you can turn it on and off. Sometimes I turn it off just to kind of clean up my view a little bit. But now, I have something that I can grab. I'm in item mode, by the way, because the texture locator is an item. And I can make bigger. And watch what happens when I start to scale it up. The texture on the model begins to change its size, because I'm physically scaling the item that's responsible for determining the placement of the texture on the mesh itself. And I'm just looking. That's pretty cool. I'm liking that. In addition, you can also rotate your texture locator. Now, I'm using the cubic projection type, so it's, yep, there we go. So if, you're, if your scallops or your roofing tiles were facing the wrong way, we can begin to change that a little bit here, too, as, as well. All right, I'm pretty cool with that. I like that. That's pretty neat. However, there are some, some big-time challenges that we need to overcome. We've fixed one thing. We've created this wonderful illusion of roofing tiles, but have we really done a great job of establishing uh, the details in here. Where is the roofing tiles breaking? The illusion that is. Uh, yeah, roofing tiles shouldn't curve around the sides, right? We shouldn't see them on the end, okay? So we need to make, so what's the solution to my problem here? We shouldn't see the roofing tiles on the end caps. Yeah, new material, you got it. So I only want to see the roofing tiles on these flat faces in here. Don't really want to see it. I want to do them one at a time. I'm just going to pause my render. So these guys. <laughs> Shift up arrow. There we go. Let's do roof caps. There we go. And now I get to pick and choose how I want this to look. Okay, I can either make it a color or put another material in there. I'm in the driver's seat as to how this is going to look. And I think just for just for quickness here, I'm going to see if I can try to color match maybe a dark, 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 dark gray. Something, something that makes sense. Or we're going to throw in another material, another texture in there if I like. But it's just got to visually be different than what's in there. Excuse me. All right. Let's unhide the rest of the mesh. And you can see the importance of that uh, inside the render itself. We're starting to break away the roofing tiles from the end caps themselves. I'll have to figure out what I'm going to do in there. But at least we're kind of in the same ballpark, as they say. You know, one thing that we could do, maybe you can even put like a piece of wood grain in there, that'd be kind of fun. Let's see if we can do that. Let's go back to textures.com. They have an entire category of wood. 
And let's do, let's go into the rough section. And I think I'm going to use, I'm going to use this guy. Yeah, let's download that. I'm just going to download the small one. Throw it in there just like I did earlier. Cool. Now, again, I got to change my projection type from UV map to something else. I always experiment with cubic, but that's maybe not necessarily going to be the result. Yeah, it's not going to work for me in here. It's going the wrong direction and it's the wrong size. If I make it smaller, well, I see the wood grain a little bit more. Yeah, so this one isn't going to work. However, maybe we try planar. Now, what I like about planar, and this is where our texture locator really comes in handy here. What I like about planar is that I can very quickly put this, oops, excuse me, make sure I have the texture locator selected. Yeah, so you can do it down here in your viewport, in your 3D view, okay. That's probably the easiest way. I'm in item mode. And what I'm going to do is just use my transform tools. And I like to do this, right? Because moving it into the relative position of the texture helps me understand the impact and the role of this texture locator on the actual model itself. It really is very, very helpful. All right, now I can see that perhaps I need to rotate this 90 degrees to get the wood grain. Is it 90 degrees? I may be off. It's definitely not 90 degrees. Let's continue to scale this down. Maybe we can see a little bit more of the grain. No. I'm going to do this by eye. believe I'm going the wrong direction, as they say. Now, the image that I've selected is pretty low res, so it's kind of hard to say, hard to see. But that's a step in the right direction. Right now, at least we're kind of starting to fill in the blanks. There's some massaging in here that we'll have to do to really round out the illusion, but that's a direction you go. We're not limited to just putting one texture on our polygons. We can put a couple different in there to get the result that we're after. Okay, so I'd continue to do that for the rest of the roof. Let's see, let's, let's find another one for uh, the walls of my house here. And I think I'm going to have it be, I'm going to go into the plaster section. Let's do bare. Let's see, what am I going to choose here? Oh, I don't know. Let's find one that works, something that's fun. I know my birdhouse would never, ever be plaster, but whatever. It's my birdhouse. I can do whatever I want. Here, I'll tell you what. Let's do brick. Brick is always kind of fun. It's going to be a heavy birdhouse. Yep, let's do, uh, let's do something really crazy and fun like this one, the patterns. Here we go. This is it. All right. Now, the great thing about using these textures is that once you download them, you have them forever. Uh, I very rarely download anything from this website because over the years, I've just you know, I've gathered this, this huge, this huge library of, uh, of photographs. So I very rarely download something new. I just go back to my existing library. All right, let's, uh, let's add this in. I'm just going to add a new material called walls. Let's do it. Image map. Load image. 
There's my crazy brick, brick pattern. And, yeah, it doesn't look right at all. It looks very, very wrong. What's the first thing that I need to do? What's the first thing? Texture locator. You got it. So we want to change it from UV map. We don't have a UV map yet. We haven't created one. So I want to explore the power of cubic. Let's see what that does. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's make it smaller. So I'm going to reduce the size of this. I don't know what to what value. I'm just kind of do, doing it visually. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm happy with that. That looks like a lot of fun. Got a little brick, a brick birdhouse. Why not, right? Select your image. Let's look at the texture locator. Yeah, change it from UV map. Oh, Got to get out of UV map. Yeah, it's always going to be on UV map. The default are UV map, and it's going to be there every single time. All right, so one more thing that I want to do here, uh, and I'm going to focus your attention on the walls. Okay, it's very, very flat. We haven't yet achieved a, a really realistic illusion at all, actually, right? It just looks like we've wallpapered our house uh, with this really cool brick pattern, right? And that's kind of effectively what we've done. It really doesn't give us the sense of height, okay? So I'm going to duplicate my image and create a bump map. I'm going to duplicate this guy. There we go. And on this top one, I want to change its role from diffuse color because I don't want it to be establishing color information. And I'm going to go into the surface shading section and choose bump. Now, the bump map, if we, as we've explored before, creates the illusion of peaks and valleys. It creates relief with inside the image itself. It's a trick, right? Wherever the computer sees dark pixels on the image, it's going to create a shadow. Wherever it, create, wherever it sees really high value pixels, like a white pixel, it's going to create a highlight. And what we're achieving is the illusion of depth. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so it's in the effect column. You can find the bump effect under the surface shading category. Yeah, that's... Displacement. And that's a great place for it in rocks, organic shapes, displacement. Yeah. Now, what drives the bump map's height is the material in the group itself. Because remember, these groups are kind of like little folders, right? So, oops, I have a, something up. So these are all little folders, right? Each folder has images and, of course, the material itself. The material has a property called bump amplitude that determines the distance all this, this height information is using. And this is another reason why we want to model and scale as much as we can. Instead of having a massive house that's many, 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 many meters in, uh, in size, if we keep it down, keep the size of our objects down to a real-world kind of connection to scale, our bump and displacement values make sense. This is a small house. I'm only bumping out uh, some of its details five millimeters. That's a good, that's a good starting point. I can, if I go to one millimeter, the illusion changes quite dramatically. Now it's not, now we don't have a whole lot of shadows and what, ha what have you. Oh, I put it at five meters. I wanted one meter, one millimeter, not one meter. There we go. So we get to modulate it. That actually looks a little bit better. Let's put this to two. Yeah, I like two better because now we're getting some really cool highlights and some really cool shadows. Let's render it real fast and then we'll turn it off uh, and we'll compare and contrast the results of having this simple bump effect inside of your object. It doesn't take too long to render this stuff, which is kind of nice. Yeah, so if you want to remove the reflections, you're going into the specular amount. In addition, you also have to reduce the Fresnel amount as well. All right, here's my 
here's my render with the bump map. And I'll do another one without it. Let's just turn it off and re-render. And we'll see, we'll see where we are. That presentation on real-time graphics earlier, I think, is uh, drawn into focus, is, is it not? By the time it has taken us to render one frame, in the, the Unreal Engine rendering everything at real time, let's see, it, just, it took 24 seconds to render one frame. In the real time world, I would have rendered 24 frames in one second, which is pretty amazing. Okay, so there it is with it off. I'll put it up to 100% so we can do a little comparison. Here it is with it on. Yeah, it just feels a little bit more dimensional because now we're creating little specular highlights around each one of the rims and starting to come to life. Absolutely. It is, it is entirely linked to the, the image that you've chosen and your model and your lighting. Uh, but it's a good natural place to begin, right? Like, I don't think the bump map would probably look too good on my roofing tiles. Let's give it a try. Let's do the, the roof material. Duplicate it. Change the top one to bump. Let's see what we get. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's render it. See what we get. It could look good, could look bad, but this is the evaluation that we need to go through to get a really good understanding of how this is going to work together. Okay, let's take a look at it. Yeah, so if you want to adjust your bump, you need to go into the material. That right there, yep, and the bump amplitude is the value that you're looking to change. I'll make it more bumpy or less bumpy, depending on what the, uh, the value is set to. All right, if we do some comparisons, uh, yeah, the, you know, adding that bump effect on my roofing tiles isn't necessarily give me a great result, but it's something, it's something, right? It's a starting point for an evaluation process on how this is all kind of working together. Questions on this idea? Cool, huh? Pretty cool. So use these tiling textures. They're really helpful. Remember the big idea behind them is that we're flooding an entire zone with texture information. It's a great way to start establishing a base texture set for uh, a big environment like, you know, like your house. Okay. So your homework assignment this week is to go in and finish your house. If you return to the week 10 module on Canvas. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. It's go time. Now we're actually trying to fill in the blanks here and create good materials and textures for every single piece of our house. Okay? So spend some time looking at how you're going to be shaping and crafting your environment with light first. Don't forget about the role of the environment. Follow the same sequence that we went through today, right? Start in the background, work your way to the foreground. Okay? It really is tremendously helpful. Okay? Get your lighting and your camera composition dialed in pretty early so that way you know exactly what picture you're going to be making and then craft your illusion around, around that picture. Sound good? So that's our goal. Materials and textures for everything. That gray gradient in the background need not apply. If you turn in a sign with a gray gradient in the background, fail. <laughs> you know, automatic F. I'm joking, there are no automatic Fs, but there's no reason to have that gray gradient, right? That gray gradient is ugly. It's horrible. We don't like it, okay? We're using 3D models. It does, yeah. And it's like, you know, put a little bit more effort into it, right? It's the default, which is ugly. So you should, an app in every moment, change it. Yeah, so go in, um, select your image. Okay, now we, we're going to do it all over here inside the shader tree. So you have your texture selected. 
and we have a tab here called Texture Locator. It's up there. That's how you change it. No, I saw that like you were moving from. Oh right, yeah. Okay, so go into item mode. Okay, and click on that box. That's the texture locator. See, it automatically selects it over here. And then you can move it around. Yep, and your texture is going to update. You're kind of far away from your mesh, so it's going to be difficult to see it in this current view. But uh, moving it up and down so is going to have an effect on it. How, how can I have an, uh, an impact on the lens? Yeah, well, I would, I would change my OpenGL viewport out of the camera view and maybe into perspective. Yeah, that way we can see what the camera is doing up here, but we can work, you know, this environment and place it without having it affect the, the final composition. So it's moving basically the uh, texture somewhere or in the, in the polygon, inside the polygon? Yeah, we're not in your, it's moving the texture, the image. That's all the texture locator is doing. It's moving the image uh, in relationship to the, to the geometry. So inside the polygon? Yeah, mm, only inside the polygons that are connected to that material group. <laughs> yeah, zoom in up here. Get real close to your, to your house. Okay, now down here in this view, let's see. Start moving. Yeah, you can just barely see. And you're on bump, so you're only going to see the little divots here, which is cool. But if you start moving your texture locator around, you'll see all of this information start to change as well. All righty, folks, let's see. It is 11.50. I'm going to give you guys uh, the remainder of class time today to work on your project. Yes.